Hello and welcome to another episode of the Melbourne Athletic Development Podcast. We're extremely humbled to be joined today by adjunct professor Mark Matson. Mark, can you give us a bit of a background on who you are and what you do? Yeah, I'm a neuroscientist. Um, I've done a lot of work on brain aging and neurodegenerative disorders of aging and a lot of work on how exercise and eating patterns influence the brain's vulnerability to these age-related disorders. And um, yeah, and so I was a chief of the Laboratory of Neurosciences at the National Institute on Aging, which is part of the National Institutes of Health in the United States. And I retired, geez, it's almost been four years ago. And I finally had time to write a book on the science of intermittent fasting. We started the research in the 1990s. And um, <laughs> and uh, so there's all these books published by random people who actually aren't haven't done the science, done any scientific research on it. So I thought yeah, since I had time, I should finally write a book. It's definitely an area that's exploded, hasn't it? And it's good that there are people like yourself who have the you know, the academic foundation to be able to explain it at the level that you are, because clearly there's some very useful um, uh, opportunities that exist from things like fasting, um, but it obviously needs to be explored in a way that's rigorously conducted. Um, one of the things that, you know, we thought about a lot with uh, this preparation for this was, you know, what actually got you into wanting to, to explore areas like fasting? Yeah, so it's, a, it's kind of a long story, but essentially we started trying to understand what's going on in, in the brain and Alzheimer's disease. Uh, why do neurons degenerate? And of course there's accumulation of this amyloid protein outside of neurons. And so we found initially in cell culture work, and then we use some genetic manipulations to make mice that get amyloid accumulation and learning and memory problems as they get older. And um, through the How do you actually induce that? Eight, what? How do, how do you induce that in, in mice? Yeah, so there's rare cases of uh, inherited forms of Alzheimer's disease in humans where if you inherit the mutant gene from a parent, you have a 100% chance of getting Alzheimer's disease at an early age. Two of the genes are gene encoding what's called the amyloid precursor protein, which as name implies, it's, it's a bigger protein and the amyloid protein that accumulates in the brain is actually a small fragment of that bigger precursor protein. And then there's another gene that essentially it controls an enzyme that cuts the amyloid protein out of the bigger protein. And anyway, so we we put those human mutated genes in the genome of mice. And so those mice get accumulation of amyloid from the mutant human amyloid precursor protein gene. And actually, we also, we've even made mice with uh, another gene mutation in a protein called tau, which is a protein that accumulates inside of the nerve cells as they de de degenerate. And when you look at these under the microscope, there's like these tangle-like structures, we call them neurofibrillary tangles. So anyway, um, aging is the major, for most people, Alzheimer's disease has no known genetic cause, but we know age is the major risk factor. When you get into your 70s and 80s, and particularly 80s, all of us are, are vulnerable to getting Alzheimer's disease. And so we did some experiments where we simply, uh, so this was in the 1990s, and it had already been known that daily calorie restriction will extend the lifespan of mice or rats a lot when you yeah. start it when they're young. And it had also been shown by a colleague of mine, Don Ingram, that every other day fasting or food deprivation, we call it food deprivation in the animals because they don't have a choice, uh, 
And anyway, so we deprive them of food for 24 hours every other day. So no food 24 hours. Then 24 hours, they have as much food as they want. And if we start that when they're young, they live up to 50% longer than do rats or mice that have food available every day. So it's like a huge effect. Um, there's one caveat with that. The, and this is actually a caveat with pretty much all human rat or mouse studies. The control, the normal conditions of the animals is they have food available all the time and they don't get any exercise. That remind you of anything? <laughs> it's modern society, humans, isn't it? Yeah. A lot of humans, right? And so, you know, we can get a we'll, we're going to get into hormesis a lot, right? That's one of the the main things. And you know, so, so I got this has obvious evolutionary implications on, you know, why this might be that food deprivation uh would have such a profound effect. Uh, on the brain and body. And so it makes a lot of sense that animals in the wild, particularly predators, it's the easiest to think about when you think about predators like wolves or whatever. Uh, what's in Australia, the main predator? I don't even know. Uh, a, there really isn't. Probably yeah. a crocodile is the only thing uh, that croc we have. <laughs> crocodiles. <Yeah. laughs> well, crocodiles, they, they probably go extended time periods without eating any prey, right? Mm. And well, and so anyway, yeah. they, they their brains and bodies have to function well when they haven't eaten for days and days or even weeks. Uh, from an evolutionary perspective, if you don't, if you aren't able to function well in a food deprived state, perhaps optimally, in competing with others, then you're not you're not going to survive and get food, and and pass your genes on. So. During other, so you have to be able to, your brain has to be able to work well in food deprived condition and your physical, you have to be able to have exert physically, probably both endurance and strength well in a food deprived state. It's interesting that you, you mention all of this because it's something that we have spoken about a lot and we try to explain this to people, particularly after reading, you know, some of your work, um, you know, we're huge fans of, of the publications that you've put out because it does put into light those perspectives, both, as you said, evolutionary, but also the more modern scientific understanding of it to allow us to be able to explain to people things like fasting, but even, you know, the stress associated with physical activity and why it's really important that we do have this variability in the types of stresses that we're exposed to, as well as the opportunity for us to go through periods where we may not have, say, food availability and why that's actually very healthy for us. Because on the surface, particularly with the recommendations that you hear now, um, I don't know if, if Jack gave you much of my background, but I, I coach track and field at a really high level and I work very closely with dietitians and they're telling my athletes you've got to eat four, five, six times a day. And although I understand uh, the perspective from a, a sports performance point of view, from that understanding of the evolutionary side of what makes humans function well, to me, it seems almost counterintuitive at times to, to always be eating. You're not, you're not a cow um, in, in my mind. And the the yeah, potential but... implications that has on recovery too, because yeah. like I think of something like fasting, upregulating yeah. autophagy and how that helps to you know, essentially clean up cell debris essentially. Yeah, this is, yeah, what you both just said, I'll, I can just follow up on that. So with exercise, right, I used to coach high school cross country and I ran a lot. Actually, I got into trail running a lot, you know, as I got older. But um, yeah, and I go, at high school, we go to, you know, we have a cross country meet and all the kids before the meet you know, getting warmed up and stuff. And then there'll always be a parent who's handing the kid a energy bar, you know, and, and I go, God dang, what, what the heck? You know, are they really don't have enough energy to, you mm -hmm. know, run a 5k or whatever. Uh, and, they, you know, I, I actually think it's, it, but from an exercise standpoint, as you know, the, 
the exercise itself is a stress, is obvious on your muscles, on your cardiovascular system, actually on other organ systems. So in your muscles, whether it's skeletal or heart, there's increased energy demand, there's increased free radical production, there's these are excitable cells, kind of like neurons, nerve cells in the brain. So when they're activated, muscle contracting or a neuron firing, sodium rushes in across the membrane, depolarizes, calcium rushes in. There's big increase, huge increase in free radical production. So most people think about free radicals as being bad, right? But actually, in the case of exercise and muscles, there's pretty good evidence now that the free radicals actually play a role in activating certain genes that encode proteins that actually, in the long run, make the muscle cells better able to tolerate, tolerate stress and stronger. But as you said, the recovery period is important, too. And we can get into you know, what's happening during the, the challenge period, whether it's the kind of more intense, acute challenge of exercise or the kind of more prolonged challenge of fasting, and then what's happening during the recovery period. And kind of the, in simple terms, the, the challenge, whether it's exercise, uh, cognitive stimulation like we're doing now, so the nerve cells in our hippocampus, which is very important in learning and memory, are very active now because we're thinking about our conversation, thinking about what we're going to say next, remembering what, you know, I'm remembering experiments we did in 1990, right? <laughs> and so, but anyway, our nerve cells are under stress. Same thing. There's increased free radical production. Their energy demand goes up when we're using them, but then during recovery period, so resting after exercise, eating after fasting, and then sleeping is critical, is very important for all your organ system. So these cycles of stress recovery, stress recovery. If you never get the stress challenge, then the cells become complacent and and they're they're gene expression mechanisms and a whole bunch of changes we can talk about uh, um, don't get activated. So I kind of like to use the word challenge from the stand. I, pre I always pretend I'm a cell, right? I pretend I'm a muscle cell or I pre pretend I'm a nerve cell. Okay. And if you think about it that way, you know, our body's made up cell of cells there with exercise you know, there's all sorts of muscle cells if you're running or, you know, being stressed at the same time. And so there's stress on each muscle cell. And then also, I know I'm talking a lot, I tend to be verbose, but um, there's also a lot of uh, coordination and crosstalk between organ systems. So, for example, now there's evidence that when you do physical exercise, there are certain proteins released from muscle cells into the blood that go to your brain and do good things in your brain and and so on. So and there's all these hormones and stuff. So during fasting, um, well, I don't know how much you want to get into this, but go for whole, it. Huh? Well, I, I think go you're for highlighting it, go for a, a few valuable things because a few points that came to my mind when you think about say redox status or free radical production from exercise of looking at some of the research of using antioxidant supplementation, things like vitamin C long-term actually mutes the adaptation to say yeah. endurance exercise. And yeah. again, I think you see similar effects when you think of non-steroidal anti-inflammatory use, again, associated with exercise can start to inhibit the activation and proliferation of satellite cells and being the precursors for developing new muscle. So it really shows that, and this is where I think we've been interested to hear your thoughts with this principle of hormesis of understanding that the process of adaptation isn't always a linear response as well, because I think one of the key principles about hormesis that I take away from it is this primary response may not always be associated with a positive sensation. 
i.e. muscle soreness and fatigue following exercise or the feeling of, of being hungry when you're in a fasted state. So uh, with that in mind, I was interested to, to hear what actually got you interested in the principle of hormesis and, and looking at researching this in more detail. Yes. So we did a lot of work. So we had animal models of Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, and also stroke. Um, those are kind of the three major brain problems that that kill people. Um, and so in the case of stroke, there's all a lot of literature going back to the 1980s. Actually, I think it started in the, the cardiology, the cardiovascular researchers who, you know, studying myocardial infarction. And they found that if they subject the heart to a mild ischemia, so essentially they, in an animal, they put a thread around one of the coronary vessels and kind of shut it off for a little while. And then, and then usually kind of release the thread so you get reflow. And that kind of mimics a heart attack where you get a a blood clot forming usually in a very narrow vessel from atherosclerosis. And then, so the blood supply is greatly reduced to the heart. Some of the heart cells may be damaged and die. But if you ex if you expose the either heart or brain cells to a mild ischemia that doesn't cause damage to the cells, and then then you wait a few days, and then you come back and you subject the heart or brain to like what's equivalent of a full blown stroke, there's less damage done to the heart or brain cells in animals had, that had what we call preconditioning. So ischemic preconditioning, you kind of pre-stress the heart or pre-stress the brain cells by shutting off their blood supply a little bit and then so anyway, that is an example of hormesis, this concept where exposure to a, to a mild or moderate stress uh, can make cells and organ systems and organisms more resistant to subsequent severe stress. And also, like in in a lot of in some of the old mystery movies or plays, they would like you arsenic and old lace have you heard of that yeah. right so and you've seen this in movies too right they over time you 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 start with a low dose of arsenic and you take some and then whatever the next week take a little more and then a little more and then after a few months you've built up your resistance to arsenic and then you sit down with the person you want to kill okay. and you drink from the the same you know supply of arsenic laced yeah so there's that i'm thinking about writing a book probably with a colleague um it'll be like a huge endeavor but on um, kind of science of hormesis kind of along the lines of my book on the science of intermittent fasting and the level that <clears throat> Some people may not understand some of this stuff, but they'll understand most of it. And then, I don't know, in, in writing a book, I think that if a person understands everything, then why are they reading it, right? If they... Yeah, that, that's a really, really good concept. You know, we say the same thing with the audience that we have with this. So, you know, we get, you know, renowned experts like yourself on talking about topics that we're sure people sometimes don't really get all of the pieces. But we say to them, you know, if it sparks some interest, then it's an opportunity for you to go and learn something. Yeah. Um, and we're not we're not going to dumb down the content. Um, that's a, that's the opportunity for you to actually extend yourself in, well, it's from a psychological and a, and a intellectual approach, but it's a hormetic approach for them to go and actually challenge themselves <laughs> yeah. a little bit. <laughs> yeah, they need to challenge themselves to go read further, and you know, um, you know, with COVID and all and all the misinformation and so on. It, well, the, the, here's a good example. So intermittent, if you would have Googled the term intermittent fasting in like 2010, just in quotes, intermittent fasting, <clears throat> the only 
the top hits would have been some scientific publications, right? Ours and some other labs. And then, and then as this got popularized, and I can tell you if you're interested in the story of why it got so popular, but yeah, please tell us. Uh, okay, so we we published a lot on animal studies, and and some of the findings were in top journals, and some clinical people who kept kept up on the literature. So some physicians, they approached me and and asked me if I'd kind of help them design and and perform or do some analyses for some human clinical trials of intermittent fasting. In like 2005, or I think we did a, we published in 2007, a small study in overweight asthma patients. And it was only a dozen or 11 patients. And before we started them on intermittent fasting, and then at, what do we do? Two weeks, four weeks, eight weeks, uh, their symptoms were evaluated. Their airflow in their lungs was evaluated with respirometer. Uh, and then blood was taken. And then all of them, so in this study, we actually didn't really have a <clears throat> proper control. So we were just comparing after intermittent fasting or during and after intermittent fasting to before. So then we put them on like a really rigorous regimen where every other day they consumed only 400 calories in the form of a shake. And, um, and actually all of them made it through the two months. <clears throat> they all they lost an average of eight to 10% of their initial body weight and their asthma symptoms improved, their airflow improved. And then in my lab, we measured markers of inflammation and oxidative damage, uh, which were down, not right away, but by actually between two weeks and a month of the initiation of the intermittent fasting is where we saw like the the biggest improvements in, in all these things. And then we did another study with Michelle Harvey in England who works with women at risk for breast cancer. They're overweight and have a family history. And so in those studies, we randomly assigned the women to either what's now called 5-2 intermittent fasting. We didn't call it that when we published the paper in 2011. We just called it intermittent energy restriction. Um, but anyway, so the bottom line in that study, we actually had a really good control. So the 5-2 intermittent fasting, the women, two consecutive days a week, they ate only about 600 calories. The other five days, they ate as they normally would. The control group ate breakfast, lunch, and, and dinner spaced out. But each meal had about 20% fewer calories than they would normally consume. So we, we did kind of like a pre-calculation that both groups over time, over weeks and months, would actually end up having the same overall calorie intake. And they apparently did because they both lost the same amount of weight over six months. And a lot of improvements in health indicators. And so we saw a greater improvement in the 5-2 intermittent fasting group in insulin sensitivity than the this calorie restriction at each meal. Then that, and then I'm, it's a little long story. Then a producer at the BBC, Michael Mosley, picked up on the study that we published in in those women. And yeah, he I, did I remember a, the, the I remember the series that he did on that. Yeah, he did a, a documentary for the BBC. Uh, it was called "Eat Fast, Live Longer." And so he came to my lab and a couple others, and then he wrote a book like right after that. So that aired in 2013. And then if you look on the internet, intermittent fasting, it was like soon after that, within the next year or so, all of a sudden there started to be a lot of chatter hmm. about intermittent fasting. So if you Google intermittent fasting now, you, you actually have trouble finding the science. You've obviously sparked some questions in both of us. We're both trying to uh, jump in, chime in here. But one of the 
questions I wanted to ask you with regards to the study of uh, intermittent fasting for people with asthma and who are overweight. One of the things you highlighted is from uh, being on a caloric restrictive diet every other day, they lost weight. That makes a lot of sense to people. But the other thing that you mentioned was that they had improvement in their asthma symptoms. Why is that? What is the connection there? Because I think that's something that people perhaps may not understand that of the connection between something like weight loss and the state of another disease within the cardiorespiratory system. In that case, probably reduced inflammation played a major role. Of course, asthma is essentially, if you look at it in simple terms, it's inflammation of the lungs, right? And so, yeah, we actually, we measured in the blood markers of inflammation and, and they went down and they went down kind of in unison with the improvements in asthma symptoms. Um, it turns out a major source of systemic inflammation is actually belly fat, the mm. what's called white adipose tissue. Um, so we have abdominal fat and subcutaneous fat, fat under our skin. And the abdominal fat is the worst fat in terms of it, it, it actually those cells, when they accumulate in someone with obesity, they actually release a lot of, of um, chemicals, molecules. Ad adipokines? Is that what you refer to them as? Yeah, some adipokines. Mm -hmm. Yep. And that, and cytokines too, that promote um, inflammation. So in general, people with obesity are more prone to a lot of inflammatory conditions. Uh, you know, not just asthma. There's others, inflammatory bowel disorders, uh, and and there's some others. So, yeah, it's something I think of with, say, osteoarthritis, where I think a lot of people associate being overweight or obese as creating more mechanical load through joints. Uh -huh. But in fact, one of the bigger issues here is that systemic inflammatory state and how those chemical markers influence metabolism or turnover in the situation breakdown of articular tissue, in particular cartilage. Yeah, that's a good point. And, you know, it turns out there was a lot of thinking that, you know, people who run a lot and, you know, pound the pavement as it were, mm. uh, you know, they should have a lot more osteoarthritis of the knee, right? But mm. actually when the studies have been done, they don't, um, you know, People who actually don't exercise are, the ones are that more get it. prone to it. So it, it's yeah. motion is lotion is what what isn't that saying right? Motion is <laughs> actually I haven't heard that one, but yeah, it makes sense. Motion I is this, joint lotion. Yeah. Well, it's similar to when you look at um, disc height in runners as well, where there is a strong association between people who do a lot of running of having better uh, disc height within the spine. So again, being protective of degeneration of the spine. Yeah. 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 Do you have a question, John? Oh, no, I just think that one of the things that's to me continues to be interesting about this is the lack of integration of this into people's thinking when it comes to particularly like management of diet, you know, and obviously we're not, experts in, in, in dietetics or anything like that. But I speak to people a lot about managing some of these things and, you know, referring to professionals to, to get these kind of conversations going. Um, but it still doesn't, it's slowly changing and you probably have more, um, you know, interactions with people who are seeing this as being a positive step, but it seems like particularly in the management of obesity, this is a very simple solution that doesn't, maybe cover ev off everything, but it gives people an opportunity to at least get their foot in the door. And I don't know that it's being spoken about as much as what it should be in terms of managing something that is clearly a huge problem now, which is obesity, particularly in the Western world is, is out of control. Yeah. Yeah. Our, our country is like the poster child for bad health habits. And a lot of it is because uh, it's capitalist, very capitalist country and 
nobody, you know, a big portion of people who make money in this country would lose their job if people were in better health. Uh, pharmaceutical industry is the obvious one, right? Where they don't benefit from people being healthy. They want people to get sick and then treat their symptoms. And you've probably seen the, the um, yeah, in the news lately about this um, glucagon-like peptide one analogs. I, I can't remember what the trade name is, Ozempic or something, but there's all sorts of them, Xenon 4, uh, Lyra yeah, People using them a lot, aren't they? Right. So now people with obesity are going to see this and they're going to say, oh, good, look, I don't have to do intermittent fasting or exercise. And uh, what I would say to them is that uh, you're, you're, you're taking a gamble that you're going to lose. Um, so, yeah. And again, doing that, something like that, you're not engaging these evolutionary conserved adaptive stress response systems. If if you're just taking a drug and your cells, it doesn't matter where they are in your muscles, skeletal muscular system, cardiovascular system, brain, um, if they're not challenged periodically, there's not going to be any drug that's going to help that. Uh, well, actually, that, that brings up a question we had for you because I know, for instance, with um, – uh, pharmacological agents, there's been a lot of attempts to create a drug to replicate uh, the molecular response for, for exercise, but actually none of them have shown to be very effective. And my understanding, limited understanding of that is related to the fact that when you think about exercise, it's providing a stimulus and a stressor to multiple systems yeah. under a certain chemical environment because you're not just upregulating, say, certain molecular pathways or changing hormones hormonal release, but also changing the cytokine environment, the um, inflammatory environment, the redox status of the individual. But I'm interested to hear, and this may be a hard question to answer, do you see the potential for any drug to be able to replicate some of the environmental or metabolic or chemical stresses that we experience from doing exercise or intermittent fasting or being exposed to other positive stresses? Somewhat. we we played around with this um, in some of our experiments. So, for example, we used uh, what's called 2-deoxyglucose. It's a, as its name implies, it, it's glucose that's lacking oxygen on position two. But it doesn't matter. It's <clears throat> What the deal is here is that 2-deoxyglucose, it's taken up. When we eat it, it's taken up into the bloodstream just like glucose. It gets into cells just like glucose through the normal glucose transporter, insulin-sensitive glucose transporter. But when it gets in the cell, it cannot be used to produce energy, ATP. So it competes with endogenous glucose, glucose already in your body. And essentially what it's doing is the cells perceive this as they're not getting enough glucose. And actually what happens is when you give 2-deoxyglucose to an animal, well, if you give it a real high level, it'll actually kill them. But at a moderate level where they're fine, they'll actually go into a ketogenic state. So they, they'll get this switch to burning fats and the ketones will go up. And so we did some experiments where we would give rats or mice 2-deoxyglucose once a day for several weeks, and then we'd subject them to experimental stroke, or we even did this in a, in a Parkinson's disease model, and we found neuroprotective effects. But these were kind of short-term experiments over a few months. So we said, well, let's let's do a lifespan study, right? Intermittent fat, if we do intermittent fasting, it'll increase lifespan. So when we did that, it didn't increase lifespan, and it actually caused some problems with the cardiovascular system, and the animals actually died earlier. You know, they died, like, whatever, 
at a year and a half of age rather than two years. So I, I think, it, you know, you, you can mimic, you can put cells under stress, but it's not the kind of controlled stress that we evolved to to deal with. Uh, and it's, it's different. But that's kind of the best, that's like the closest example I can think of of trying to mimic mm. the stress, energetic stress of exercise. With this principle of hormesis, the way that I think about it with my profession as a physiotherapist is if I see someone with an injury, whether that be a hamstring strain from running, in a very simplified way, you can think of, well, why has this person injured themselves? And I look at it two ways. It could be because they haven't applied enough stresses prior to that event to be able to tolerate the stress of that particular movement or um, being able to perform at that competitive level, or also potentially applying too much stress at once. Perhaps they have a change in their training load that causes too much stress and a, a, a maladaptation of the body that predisposes them to injury. First question is, do you think that's a, a, a reasonable uh, framework to look at an injury? And, and, and more broadly, do you think, particularly now when you think of chronic diseases that we are exposed to within our environment, when we think about things like cardiovascular disease or anything associated with metabolic syndrome, type 2 diabetes, do you also see that as a mismatch between the stresses that we get exposed to in our modern environment and the fact that we've moved away quite a bit from the stresses we were exposed to in our evolutionary environment. Some of the things that you've talked about already with regards to physical activity on a regular basis, changes in our diet of excessive caloric consumption, perhaps no intermittent fasting that would have naturally happened again in our evolutionary environment. Do you think it's a, a, a useful framework to look at chronic diseases in that way? Yeah, so the the first part, you you know more about it than me, but but I did coach, as I mentioned, high school cross country, and I, so I know you can you can have you know a dozen people do exactly the same workouts, do the same stretching regimens, whatever, same cool down, same uh, toning, you know, and and some get injured and the others don't, mm -hmm. right? So in that sense, it's I mean, that kind of says that we don't know that it's something we, do. we don't know exactly why. It could be just some little thing like just um, in a certain point in the workout, they step wrong or something, you know. And uh, But the second part, yeah, so there, there's this paradox of the, story that calorie restriction and intermittent fasting increase lifespan and seem to protect against age-related diseases. And, and the kind of this applies a little bit to exercise. And the paradox is that <clears throat> calorie restriction, say daily time restricted eating, for example, will result in elevated cortisol levels. So actually, my my personal cortisol levels are like an upper part of normal. I, I do t daily time restricted eating. My, I eat all my food within the six hour time window every day, and then I so I skip breakfast. I work out like at l between eleven and noon, and then I'll eat you know like that. That's kind of my routine, and so. So, and I knew about this a long time ago. So we did some studies, we focus on the brain. So this gets a little complicated, but not too much. People have to re just remember two things. Uh, one is GR and the other is MR. Cortisol, the way it affects cells is by binding to one of two different proteins. One is called GR or glucocorticoid receptor. And the other is called MR or mineralocorticoid receptor. So, and these, turns out these proteins that cortisol binds to are actually transcription factors. They go to the nucleus of a cell and turn on or off certain genes. So other labs had shown with, with chronic uncontrollable psychosocial stress, 
which gets to your, your point about modern societies, um, is a bad stress for the brain, but for other organ systems, cardiovascular system, and causes elevation in cortisol levels. So people had looked at what happens to GR and MR with chronic, uncontrollable, bad stress. And what they found was that levels of GR go up and MR go down. Okay. So what we found with intermittent fasting, it's like, it's exactly the opposite. Levels of GR go down and MR go up. So even though cortisol levels are high with intermittent fasting or calorie restriction, the way that the cells respond to the cortisol is different. Is that, you follow me? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so and I, I think what you're highlighting here too, and correct me if I'm wrong, is stresses are best applied to the body intermittently, acute, like in the periods where you apply it, but then there's also periods where you don't apply it. The issue is when you have that chronic exposure to a stress so you don't get that effective adaptation. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And exercise, during exercise, obviously your epinephrine, adrenaline goes up, cortisol levels go up. And actually that's good because that's they're involved in getting more energy to the cells kind of acutely during the during the exercise itself and for some time period after and then they come back down. Yeah, yeah I think that's, again, a, that's an interesting one because uh, there's this thing that everyone, I think at least, seems to think that cortisol is always bad. And it's good that you're kind of giving some more background to that because I think it highlights in certain situations, not only is it vital, but also that it will actually act very specifically to the type of stress that you're applying. And I think that's one of the things that complicates, you know, the Jack asked the question previously about pharmacological agents. One of the problems you have is you don't necessarily have the ability to control those specific um, targets that certain behaviors seem to be able to have on different, as you said, organ systems or uh, structures within the cell. Um, that is unique seemingly to some of the environmental stresses that we can expose ourselves to. And it is, I think it's, a, it's one of the most interesting parts of how intelligent evolution is to be able to find those kind of solutions to be so specific to targets. Yeah. And so we've talked mainly about two kind of physiological challenges, exercise, fasting, and and intellectual challenges, keeping your mind active. And then, you know, we just recently got a, a infrared sauna. So I'm starting to use that now. Mm-hmm. Um, and actually one reason, I don't know if you saw this, uh, on one of my podcasts, and I think they put a short one on, I told about my issue with these injuries I had and surgeries and, but anyways, so I, used to trail run and then mountain bike. I actually started to have some knee issues. So my quads probably weren't strong enough. So I did mountain biking. And then I had a mountain bike accident. And it was real bad. I On the right side, I completely tore my rectus abdominis off the pubic bone. And I had tearing of the adductor. And I had a little bit of tearing on the left. So I had three surgeries. And then like my adductors were weak and then I started to have bad tendonitis in my peroneal tendons because I wasn't keeping my knees in when I walked. And then it got more complicated than that because I I was having really a lot of pain, right? And, And it started to have a lot of pain in the feet and the pain seemed to be out of proportion to you know, anything that showed up on MRI or clinical exam and so on. And, and my strength, except for the adductor, seemed okay. And so I got together with a neurologist friend of mine and and we kind of brainstormed and he, he kind of diagnosed me with some sort of neuropathy, peripheral neuropathy. And so we did genome-wide exome sequencing on my DNA. So essentially we sequenced all, all my genes. And it turns out I have a, a mutation in a voltage-dependent sodium channel that's highly expressed in 
nociceptive neurons. Those are mm. neurons that convey right. pain. And these are rare mutations, but, and then it happens like I know the world's expert on these mutations. And he's, <laughs> that's, he's that's seen, helpful. He's seen other people with these mutations and they can be really debilitating because something that causes like, you mentioned inflammation. So like something that you get like mild inflammation in a normal person would just be kind of, kind of a minor issue with me and other people who have these mutations. It's like these, these pain neurons are firing like crazy. Uh, but anyway, yeah, so I've kind of been able to manage that a little bit with a couple drugs, but exercise still helps. I find, oh, this was the other thing that happened. When I had all this going on for like several months, I couldn't exercise really at all. And except for, I couldn't really, I didn't really do any aerobic exercise. I was kind of doing some physical therapy, but it wasn't much. And so like I got depressed, actually clinically depressed almost. So this is another effect of exercise is really potent antidepressant. And we we have evidence from our animal studies and even some of our human studies that people who adapt to intermittent fasting eating pattern over a period of several weeks to a month, their mood is elevated. You know, and yeah, so I so what else was I going to say? Um, yeah, the sauna. So I'm starting to do the sauna, and that's kind of helping, I think, actually with the exercise. Well, from a scientific point of view, have you, have you got some background on you know some of the the research behind sauna? I know that there's been a fair bit into ideas around like you know heat shock proteins and what influence right. they tend to have on some of those factors. Yeah. We looked at this in the brain. We saw that others have looked at it in other tissues. Uh, so exercise will increase levels of heat shock proteins. Uh, and it's it could be part and due to increased temperature in the cells, but these, these proteins don't just increase in response to temperature. They increase in response to other types of stress. For example, I mentioned this preconditioning of the heart or brain that is kind of a mild stress that protects against that will induce heat shock proteins. We found intermittent fasting induces certain heat shock proteins in nerve cells in the brains of animals. Uh, yeah, so that's, that's another kind of generalization one can make that different types of stress kind of feed into a lot of these same conserved signaling pathways and patterns of gene expression. So we see quite a bit of overlap in the effects of exercise and intermittent fasting on gene expression in the brain um, and, and in muscle too. Um, so, so these cycles during the, the fasting or exercise, it's a stress. There's upregulation of Intrinsic antioxidant enzymes, those are actually the proteins in your cells that remove the free radicals. And they're, they're much more important than anything we put outside the cells in terms of vitamin E or vitamin C. Then heat shock proteins, these proteins that help protect other proteins from damage. Then uh, autophagy which you've all, I'm sure, heard about. So it's a cells uh, recycling and garbage disposal system that's stimulated by both exercise and fasting. We showed that in muscle, actually. And and then, then during the recovery, so during the challenge, exercise, fasting, cells go into stress resistance, conserve resources mode. So actually they're, uptake of amino acids, the building blocks of proteins goes down during the stress, whether it's exercise or fasting. And they go into a conserve resources mode. Then when you rest and eat, 
then the cells go into a growth and plasticity mode. So then amino acids are taken up readily and, you know, protein synthesis occurs. So your muscles actually, your muscles get bigger with cycles of exercise. And that's what I was going to ask. Is there actually research and evidence to show that by using some sort of protocol like this, you may actually get greater benefits to the exposure of say exercise stress because you're using fasting um, as a bit of a switch between those two different states? The answer is there. there is evidence. Uh, we published papers, I can send it to you if you haven't seen it, in, in mice, where we had four groups of mice <clears throat> uh, ad limitum feeding, so no intermittent fasting, sedentary. Then we had intermittent fasting, 45 minutes daily treadmill training. And then we had... Um, ad libitum feeding, treadmill training, and then we had inter- we had the combination, all the combinations. So yeah. we went, went over two months. Every two weeks, we'd increase the incline and speed of the treadmill. And then at the end of the two months, we did a maximum endurance test on the treadmill. We did, took blood samples with a lot of focus on ketones. And so the bottom line is that, as you would imagine, both, both it didn't matter whether the animals were on ad libitum feeding or intermittent fasting, their exercise over two months, their endurance was much better than those that didn't exercise. But when we compared the exercise, no intermittent fasting, to the exercise with intermittent fasting, endurance was better in the group that was on intermittent fasting during that two months of endurance training. And then there was a boost in ketones. It's actually very prominent. Uh, when when they run on a treadmill in the fasted state, the ketones go way up. And I noticed in my own running, trail running, I'd, so I'd usually, so I haven't eaten breakfast for like 30 or 40 years, but so I'd go in to the lab early work in the lab till like 11, then I'd eat, and then work till like four in the afternoon, then go on a, like an hour trail run. Out, and there's some nice trails on the way home. And and then, you know, I'd, I always take my lunch with me. I didn't, I actually didn't take time out of my day for lunch. I just ate while I worked. And so sometimes I'd forget my lunch. Uh, but I'd still go on the trail run. And I found this, and actually I started timing myself and on the same exact trail run. And I found I actually ran better when I hadn't eaten anything that day. Yeah, well, that's an interesting uh, concept. I've spoken to... So you know, I, th- I think what's us, happening, if, 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 you, if you start a long run and say like four hours or whatever after eating five hours. And then glucose is always used first from your liver, right? So at some point in the run, that liver glucose is going to be depleted and you're going to have to switch to fat. And I think that, and and there's always like this down period in my run. And so this is, I have no data on this. I just, I educate a guest. I think if this metabolic switch is occurring during the event, some endurance event, that that's a bad thing and the performance is going to go down for a while. I'm not sure how long, 10 minutes, 15 minutes. I, I'm not sure. So I think it's better to start the event in a ketogenic state and stay in that state. Don't take any glucose. During the and event. part of that also too is dependent on your metabolic flexibility. That is your ability to be able to effectively convert from using one energy substrate to another as well, yeah. which you'll obviously improve and adapt over time the more you are familiar with either performing in a yeah. fasted state or you know potentially also adopting like a low carbohydrate diet so that you actually need to be forcing the body to go into that ketogenic physiology as well. But I think yeah. the thing that's interesting here is 
you're highlighting that, and I think this is very relevant for us, that physical performance isn't just limited by the actual parameters of your physical training. I mean, yes, that's certainly a very important element. And for the, the clinic environment we work in, we do work a lot with elite athletes. So honing in their training is a really important component to their performance. But I think the thing that can often be missed is how some of these other factors associated with diet, and that's not just simply about what you're eating or how much you're eating, but also when you're eating, in addition to potentially other types of uh, stresses, like for instance, we're talking about like thermogenic stresses when you think about heat or cold therapy. These are other things that have a really significant influence on your physiology and therefore impact your ability to either maintain good metabolism during a training stimulus, uh, but also provide other types of signals. Like I know, for instance, there's been some more recent research of looking at, say, doing endurance running in a fasted state and how that can further enhance mitochondrial function, which is obviously really important for being able to maintain energy production. Yeah, there's there's a lot to be done in the human, you know, exercise field on this, I think. Um, I tried to, so I'm here, my lab's in Baltimore on one, one of Johns Hopkins campuses. And it just happened, I had some, Pulse back fellows in the lab who they were they were runners in college actually a couple of them pretty good, and so they were doing volunteer coaching for the college cross country and 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 track distance runners and so of course they're in my lab so they learned a lot about intermittent fasting right and and they started to play around with it themselves and then so I contacted the college coach and I talked to him about hey, it would be neat to do a study in, in these college kids. And it just happens like the girls team was really good. Like they, they'd actually won national championship a couple of years in a row in the division they're in. The boys team, not so good. So I said, you know, I understand you don't want to mess with these kids. And I think that's part of the thing. You know, the worry that if you change something, it's going to make it worse. But I said, well... Can you do this? Just to, in, the, in the case of the men's team, say when when you start your, your training in summer or during their summer training program, um, like d divide them into two groups and have one of them adapt to daily time restricted eating and, and the other not, and then and then you know and they essentially they run on the same most of the same courses every year. So you, you can have the, you know, you can look at their time from the previous year on the same course and so on. And then, so the idea would be to compare performance, relative improvement or whatever. You compare the two groups, but also compare that within a person from the previous time. But somebody's got to take a little risk when you're talking about like, in some some competitive situation where you've got a coach who who doesn't really want to take a chance that oh if I have these guys do intermittent fasting you know it could make it worse and then you know so you know how do you get beyond that and yeah I don't know have you had those feelings before John what's that <laughs> not wanting to to change stuff too much in the the fear of potentially having a negative effect oh yeah but i think like the question that comes up from what you're talking about mark is whether um from what i've seen particularly they've, they've trialed especially through the australian institute of sport they really trialed a lot of uh, dietetic input for you know uh, fat adaption and, and shifting people to ketogenic type diets and they found that it, it didn't really seem to give the response that they were hoping for. They, they did give it a good chance. I think it was a multiple month study. Um, the the question I had was whether you had, and I have looked for it, but I, I haven't really found anything solid of whether you had any background on non-endurance type sports um, and the effect that something like intermittent fasting has, um, you know, like things that are you know, maybe more field based um, and, and high speed, you know, obviously you guys have the, something like the NFL um, and, and for, you know, if it is a track athlete, someone who's more on the speed power events, um, you know, jumps, throws, sprints, rather than necessarily the endurance events, if you have any background on that. 
No, I, I haven't seen anything on that. I, there have been studies with resistance training, quite a few studies now, and essentially they showed compared to no intermittent fasting, really no significant difference. And with or without intermittent fasting, muscle mass can be maintained and built about the same. So there's no negative effect. Of course, if you're doing, and, and I think bodybuilders kind of learned this serendipitous or just by trial and error a long time ago, if they do their lifting in a fasted state, then they're still able to build muscle, but they lose more fat because the ketones are going up more. And of course, they want us to see their muscles, right? So that mm-hmm. means they want big, not only big muscles, but not much fat. And yeah. so I think the, you know, and as much as the, the fasting, the fasting can promote fat loss and fat is weight. In, in some sports, uh, you know, having low fat is really helpful. Distance running it is. I mean, yeah. you, you look at body mass index of the elite, whatever, Kenyans, Ethiopians, they're like 19 or even 18. And these guys, you know, they're running a marathon and they're not, you know, a pound or two Adds, it makes a difference over oh, twenty six miles. Yeah. yeah. The, so the I, qu- I go ahead. Um, but I have had I had a NBA player contact me. He was thirty two years old. I'm not going to give his name, but he's he's fairly well known. But his performance started to go down, right? Which you know, he's when you get into your when you get in your early 30s, except for endurance sports, you can keep going a little longer. But particularly for things that require, you know, speed and bursts, you know, fast twitch muscles, that goes bad first. But anyway, you know, essentially I told him, you know, if this can help you lose, in theory, if this can help you lose a little fat and then maintain muscle mass, you should be able to jump just a little bit higher or whatever, but he, he's, I think he's doing it. He's, I don't know if he's doing any better. He's still playing. Uh, he's not doing any worse. So um, he, 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 he got, he got, he's on a different team now. Actually, I think he's on Boston now. Um, but yeah. One of the questions that I had that, that shifts the topic slightly is on, and and excuse my ignorance, but as a neuroscientist, if you can maybe help understand this is with learning, is that a hormetic process? Is psychological stress, um, you know, uh, experienced in the brain and in the, the, the neural cells of the brain in a similar way to normal or, you know, their peripheral systems and the peripheral cells? Um, and is it a hormetic process? No. Because I don't really understand um, exactly how, you know, we have some sort of input of something we don't understand. And then all of a sudden, with enough exposure to that information, we then are able to kind of not only maybe remember it, but also maybe understand a little bit and start to then explore it. Wow. There's literally thousands of neuroscientists working on this question. But we, we know quite a bit about it, but we don't know everything. Um, okay, so it works like this. Actually, I wrote a I wrote a second book that's in it's at the publisher now. It'll come out in August. It's called Sculptor and Destroyer: Tales of Glutamate, the Brain's Most Important Neurotransmitter. Okay, but anyway, so you have neurons that are connected as synapses, and for example, now when I talk to you and you're we're on what is it? It's not Zoom, but whatever it is. So you can see me. So you're getting information coming through sensory neurons in your ear. The sound is activating and neurons in the retina of your eye that are being activated. And then those signals are going through a couple circuit steps back to a brain region called the hippocampus. And so information simultaneously from your ears and eyes 
is converging on certain synapses, connections between nerve cells in the hippocampus. And <clears throat> the pairing of, of my words uh, and you're seeing me is converging. And so that information, it's essentially a convergence of inputs at the same time temporally that leads to increased calcium in nerve cells and in over time can increase size of synapses and even the number of the synaptic connections. So with learning and memory, essentially there's an increase in the size of some synapses, which can be retained for a long time. And if you if you keep repeating something over and over, the strength and the size of those synapses gets bigger and, and they're maintained longer. So actually connections are maintained are formed and maintained or increase in size. So that's kind of a simple explanation. Wait, where does glutamate works. fit into that? Glutamate is the neurotransmitter that's released from the axon terminal of one nerve cell onto the dendrite postsynaptic cell of another. So it's the signal from one nerve cell to another that excites this excitatory transmitter. One question I would ask you, Mark, was we we're talking before about autophagy and the process of autophagy that does occur in, say, a fasted state. One thing I was thinking of is thinking of joint tissue and joint degradation. And one of the things that's unique to cartilage and specifically chondrocytes is they cannot undergo mitosis, that is cell division. And so I think one of the I proposed series I've heard is the importance of things like autophagy to maintain the healthy state of a chondrocyte so it can maintain its function of maintaining the extracellular matrix. So I was interested to, to hear, do you know of, have you done any research yourself or do you know of any research of whether it's in animal models or you know, even better human models of looking at things like autophagy for maintaining or optimizing joint health? Uh, no, and I'm, you know, that literature on, on joints, I'm not really up on. Okay. So, yeah, I don't know. So the idea with some of the stem cell, you know, injecting stem cells in there, I think is that the, the problem with that, I think most of the stem cells that are injecting in there don't become chondrocytes. So they can't produce the, they don't produce the collagen. You know, that, that actually has, the general thinking has a lot of potential. The idea would be is if you can introduce cells in there that produce collagen. Um, but exercise, again, you know, using, using that, um, that joint can help maintain the collagen. Yeah, no, it's a it's a concept, John, and I've talked about. And if you look at the research of exercise for enhancing uh, cartilage in a joint, there seems to be not much capacity in a, in, a, in an adult, at least. Certainly, it's much more adaptable in a, a child or an adolescent. But I've always questioned whether one of the issues when you think of a condition like osteoarthritis is we can't just look at it as a musculoskeletal condition. It's very much uh, an issue of poor systemic health with regards to, and there's lots of um, correlation yes. between things like poor metabolic health and having mm -hmm. factors associated with metabolic syndrome that increase your susceptibility to OA. And part of it made me think of is the issue with maintaining good joint health related to not just applying the appropriate mechanical stressor to maintain the integrity of the tissue, but also making sure that your metabolic state and inflammatory state allows the chondrocytes to function yeah, yeah. optimally. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense to me. I, but I'm, I'm not up on the literature on that. So, Okay. One other question we like to ask our, um, our guests is, is there something that you're exploring or researching at the moment or learning about at the moment that gets you particularly excited or interested? <laughs> 
That, so I mentioned I retired. So actually now I, I don't have an active lab. I'm, mm -hmm. I teach a couple courses at Johns Hopkins for the graduate neuroscience program. And then I wrote these two books, Intermittent Fasting and this other one, um, starting to scratch out some ideas for uh, for one on hormesis. And yeah, and I'm, I do a podcast. I didn't, I don't know if you know that, but I do a podcast that's called Brain Ponderings. It's me talking to other prominent neuroscientists at the forefront of brain research. And so it's at a level, it, it, we try to make it a level that, again, it, it's kind of the level that most people understand some of it, but not all of it. Um, but it's pretty far reaching that, that my own podcast. So that's how I'm spending my time now. I'm also kind of a cheerleader for certain clinical uh, investigators at Johns Hopkins who are, are planning, trying to get money for human clinical trials in people with various diseases. Uh, there's already one with, uh, investigator who works with people with multiple sclerosis. She's done a couple preliminary studies with encouraging results in terms of maybe some alleviation of the symptoms and and then she wants to do a bigger study. Um, cardiovascular people are interested. Heart failure. So one thing we found in rats, this is another interesting thing. So we did these studies in rats where we implant transmitters, uh, actually one in the heart muscle and then one in the blood vessel descending aorta or on it. So essentially, we can monitor continuously 24 seven heart rate and blood pressure. And so we took the animals, we switched them to every other day fasting. And then over a period of a few weeks and, and continuing through a month, there's a reduction in resting heart rate and blood pressure. And it stayed down. We did actually, we did both daily time restricted eating and every other day fasting, both groups, heart rate and blood pressure went down. Then we switched them back to ad libitum feeding. And within a couple of weeks, heart rate and blood pressure were back up. And then we looked at heart rate variability, which I'm sure you've heard about. Um, it's So if, if my resting heart rate is say 50, no, let's make it math easy, 60. My resting heart rate is 50, but let's say it's 60. Um, and say both of yours is 60. That doesn't mean that there's exactly one second between each heartbeat. It could be 0.9 seconds, then 1.1. And it turns out a lot of variability in that interbeat time interval is a good thing. Trained endurance athletes have high heart rate variability. And the reason is there's increased parasympathetic tone so your your heart rate is regulated by two components of the autonomic nervous system, the parasympathetic, which releases acetylcholine onto the heart and slows heart rate, and um, the sympathetic nervous system, which speeds up the heart rate through norepinephrine. So anyway, essentially what this means in layman's terms is that with endurance training, aerobic exercise, and with intermittent fasting, your heart is better able to adapt to different stress conditions. Um, and yeah, so I thought that was I thought that was pretty interesting. Yeah, well, the other two big ones that influence it are uh, stretching and breathing itself, because like the it's interesting to note that you know, heart rate variability occurs with changes in inhalation and exhalation. During exhalation, from what I understand, you get a reduction of the sympathetic input, which then yeah, actually slows true. the heart rate down, as opposed to the inhalation where you typically get an elevation. Yeah, that's true. Mm -hmm. So anyway, another another good reason to um, to change eating pattern, intermittent fasting, reduce blood pressure. 
All right, Mark, uh, I think we won't hold you up anymore because uh, we know it's your evening there. Thank you so much for giving up your time. Um, we know that you are a world-renowned expert and, and we're actually extremely grateful to have someone of your knowledge be willing to come on and talk with us about all things hormesis and, and, and your research and, and obviously some of the books and, and the podcasts that you're doing. So we'll try and uh, put links to that in, in the show notes for people so that they can have a look at those and, uh, and get onto some of your work because uh, we really appreciate what you've contributed to the field of science. All right. Thanks a lot. I enjoyed it. Uh, have a good rest of the day down there. Yeah, you too. Thank you. All right.